Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. I'm Mike Noggle, the pastor here at Mount Cory United Methodist, and we're very glad that you joined us this morning. Glad those of you who are at home watching on the internet. Uh, thank you for coming um, and tuning in. Have a number of announcements. There's a few uh, announcements and thank you notes in the uh, bulletin. A um, couple things we want to point out. Uh, the get-togethers uh, for Mount Cory with uh, the pastor have all been completed. Uh, but if you did not get a chance to go to one, please call the office or let me know. We can always schedule more. I certainly have enjoyed that time to get to know uh, you better and to um, for um, us to share. And uh, like I said, if you uh, did not get a chance and wish to still, just let us know. We'll schedule some more. Speaking of get-togethers, we are going to have a get-together with the youth of this church. Uh, so any youth who go to Mount Cory or even Pleasant View uh, from fifth grade up to high school, uh, two weeks from today, August 2nd, Sunday, right after this service at 1130 downstairs, we'll have some pizza. It'll just be uh, you guys, the youth of the church and myself, and we'll chat and get to know each of you a little bit better as well. So uh, let us know if you're coming so we know how much to get, but if you don't uh, make a reservation, no reservations are required, uh, so just, just come. Um, we are continuing to collect toys uh, for uh, Brayla and Simon, the nine-year-old uh, who has uh, beaten back cancer, and he's taking toys down to Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, uh, and uh, we will be collecting new and unwrapped toys between now and the end of the month and we'll get those over to him. His goal is to take 400 toys uh, with him uh, on, that, on his next appointment, which is the first week of August. Uh, if you do not want to go out and shop, but you want to contribute, and for those of you who are watching online and are not local and, but still want to help, if you scroll down on our Facebook page, there is the article uh, that appeared in the local paper. There is a place, a link to the uh, a site where you can go in, shop, have it shipped directly to their house. You don't have to touch it. You don't even have to bother with it. Uh, so if you're interested, there's an option for you as well. We have a couple of uh, uh, concert possibilities for you coming up. Next Sunday, uh, July 26th, down at Westminster, they're having a concert in the park. It's free. Uh, it's open air. Uh, and it will be on Faulkner Road in Westminster. It will, it's from 11 o'clock to 4 p.m., having several Christian artists, including the group Sela, who's been around a long time. Some of you might uh, be familiar with them. They've actually been in this area a number of times before. So that's next Sunday. And then, of course, we've been talking about the Casting Crowns uh, concert over at the High Road uh, Drive-In on 68 north of Kenton. That's Saturday, August 15th at 7 o'clock. The tickets they have less, they, they sell tickets by the carload. You can have up to six people in a car. The only tickets they have left are the $75 tickets. You're still in the drive-in, but you're facing the second screen, and it'll be shown on the second screen. But they're only $75, so that's down to $12 uh, to $15, so that may be even better. If you're interested, uh, let me know, and we can maybe uh, get a group to go. Um, I know a lot of you are on Facebook. Uh, if you have friended me, I have uh, uh, accepted that uh, request. I have not reached out to you, but I'm more than willing. If you send me a friend request, I will accept it. So I just don't want to impose on you. So uh, if you are wondering, why hasn't this guy asked me to be a friend? Well, uh, I want to be your friend too. So just let me know and I, I will do that. Um, any other announcements uh, that we need to cover? Uh, this morning that we haven't already. Next Sunday, the Sunday service here at Mount Cory will be a message titled An Eternal Adoption. I think it's something that you will really appreciate and enjoy. Please come, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, bring, bring somebody along with you, uh, and uh, we will have a nice time of service then. This time, uh, Lana, would you prepare our hearts and minds for worship?
Thank you, Lana. It's nice to have you back. You've entered the Father's house. You leave the world outside. His arms are open wide here in the Father's house. Lay your burdens down. Take up your crown. You're in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore here in the Father's house. You see, love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Prison doors swing wide. The, do the dead come to life. Miracles take place. The sinful find faith. Love is breaking through because the Father is in this room. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to worship you this morning. We offer our prayers, our praise, and our music up to you out of gratitude for what you have done for us. May it be a sweet sound to your ear, and may we touch your heart as we give ourselves over to you. We ask this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn Stand up, stand up for Jesus on page 514. And if you're able, how do you not stand up for this song? So why don't you stand up and uh, we will share this hymn together. Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are brave now serve him against the number foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. You may be seated. And I just realized I threw you a curve. We sang the first and second, the bulletin said first and fourth. But thanks for your flexibility and joining along. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Well, if that's the worst thing that happens in a service, hey, we're doing all right. <laughs> it's now time for a prayer requests. I know there's uh, a number of people listed on the back of your bulletin. And for those at home, uh, most of those names are also uh, in the newsletter. Uh, that you may have received. Uh, this has been quite a week for a number of people uh, in our area. We have a um, granddaughter of someone in the community that was life lighted uh, yesterday uh, up to Toledo. Uh, we're not sure of her condition, but it's uh, pretty grave. So we need to keep them in our prayers. Also a daughter of someone uh, in the area has is recovering from back surgery. It went pretty well, but uh, obviously we won't know the success of that until uh, the um, recovery from the surgery itself. Right in this congregation, the son of one of our members is recovering from a motorcycle accident and facing another surgery tomorrow morning up in Toledo, dealing with a partially amputated left leg. And we also need to remember the Dunbar family from over at the Liberty Benton area. Uh, their 18-year-old son, who just graduated from Liberty Benton this year, lost his life in a vehicle accident at the same location as that motorcycle accident. So that is very difficult. 
Also, continued prayers for our country as we deal with this coronavirus. Just when we think we're making headway, then uh, it looks like things are going the other way and uh, we don't have all the answers and the answers keep changing. So uh, we just need to trust that God has uh, control of this and uh, ask for his guidance and assistance. Are there any other prayer requests uh, from the congregation today that we need to lift up? Yes, Regina. Okay. Uh, Ryan Blackburn, he's on the bulletin. He's continuing to re recover from a motorcycle accident just north of town here a few weeks ago. He's able to partially move uh, his left side and he continues to recover. Uh, eventually he will go into a rehab center. So we need to continue to remember him. He's got a long road to go. Anybody else? Kim. Family. I don't know if they're still in the area, but I think he graduated in 2000. Okay. So uh, for those who were not able to hear on the internet, uh, Brett Jacobs, a Corey Rawson graduate from uh, about 20 years ago, uh, was found dead in his uh, garage from what is possibly an electrical accident. Uh, so we have a lot of heavy things that we need to take the Lord today. Anything further? Yes. TC. Absolutely. And TC is reminding us that despite all the bad things that are happening around us and all the things that weigh heavy on our, our things we need to be grateful for and uh, give gratitude to God for as he is deserving of that. And we receive those blessings every day. Any others? Yes. Good. We have a young man, Gage, who we've been praying for for some time. He had his kidney transplant <clears throat> surgery finally last week, <clears throat> and that went well. He's recovering, so is the person who donated it. So of all of these things, we can certainly give praise for that. Anything further? All right. Our prayer hymn this morning, Sweet Hour of Prayer. The first and third verses, I'm reading it correctly this time. <laughs> Page 496. from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and oft escaped 
the tempter snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace. I'll cast on him my every care and wait for the sweet hour of prayer. O oh, Father, creator of us all, great is your faithfulness. New mercies we see every day. We thank you for the blessings that you bestow on us. Help us in times of darkness, in times of trouble, in times of pain, to look past those and see that there are things to be grateful for and that you are with us and abide with us always. We have many things that we need to bring to your attention today. Actually, you know all of those things already. The people listed in the bulletin, those who are going through uh, periods of grief for the loss of a loved one, those who are recovering from injuries and illnesses and surgeries, We give you praise for successful surgeries and ask for continued healing uh, for those individuals. And we ask for your continued mercy and guidance and delivery from this virus that affects us in so many ways, both physically and financially and emotionally. Help us to keep our trust and faith in you. And help us remember just how much you love us. A love so deep that you are willing to give your one and only son as a sacrifice for us. That we might live with you for all of eternity. We thank you for your love and your devotion and your care. And we most especially thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Do we have, we don't have a children's moment today? Okay, it doesn't look like we have anyone young enough that we need to do it. And we're not going to force Haley or Macy to come up and sit through something that's far beneath them. So, Gary, you want to uh, come forward and read the scripture for us today. Thank you, Gary, and praise God for the reading of his word this morning. Before we get into the message this morning, will you pray with me as I pray the words of David? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be accepted our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Bible, as we all know, is divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The name associated with the first part of the book is unfortunate because just like objects that we think of as old, there is a tendency in some churches and some denominations to consider the books in that section of the Bible to be outdated, of little use, of no great value. Some tend to focus almost exclusively on the New Testament. After all, the Old Testament is filled with peoples and nations whose names we can't pronounce, right, Gary, and who do not even exist any longer. It is filled with traditions and rituals that we do not understand or even practice. Some treat it like a book that has to be taken off the shelf, and before its use, they have to blow the dust off the cover before even opening it to read the pages. But that's not how Jesus viewed it. When he was just a boy and teaching in the temple, and at all other times during his ministry, when he was instructing people about the scriptures, what do you think he was teaching them? The Old Testament wasn't called that then. The New Testament didn't even exist yet. Many times throughout the New Testament, Jesus refers to people, events, teachings from the Old Testament. And if Jesus, the Messiah, is as we all know the fulfillment of scriptures, how can we possibly understand the meaning of that statement if we don't know what the scriptures are that he is fulfilling? The Old Testament contains many of the most famous Bible stories that we grew up with from the time we were small children. It contains some of the most well-known and quoted scripture of all time and some of the most beautiful poetry and imagery that was ever written. It contains warnings about the consequences of disobeying God's instructions and prophecies of what was and is to come. So our challenge whenever we open to a passage of the Old Testament is to ask two questions as we read from these books. 
First, since the passage is here for a reason, and all scripture is there for a reason, what is God trying to tell me through those verses? And second, how can I apply what God is saying to my life today? The text that I have been led to share with you this morning comes from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, chapter 17. If you have your Bibles with you, or for those of you watching at home, if you have them close at hand, feel free to take a moment to open them to that chapter. While you're doing that, let me set the scene. God's people have been in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years. God heard the cry of his people, and he selected Moses to be his representative to Pharaoh to demand, to demand that he let the Hebrew people go. And of course, Moses said, sure, God, I won't even go home and pack my bags. I'll go right over that Pharaoh and tell him what's what, right? Uh, no. Remember, Moses used every excuse he could to get out of it. Why should they listen to me? I'm not a good speaker. I killed an Egyptian once. I'm not your man. Send somebody else. Of course, when God determines that it is his will to use someone for his purposes, he'll make it happen. And I'm standing before you here this morning as living proof of that. So God sends Moses off with a staff, a rod of God, with which he will do miraculous things, and with Aaron, his brother, the Levite, who God provided to be at his side and to be his spokesman, if you will, they led the children of Israel out of Egypt. The Israelites even witnessed the miracle that finally led to their freedom, the parting of the Red Sea, as Moses held aloft that staff of God. So the Hebrew people were grateful to God for saving them and for sending Moses to be their leader, and they all lived happily ever after, right? <laughs> of course not. If that were the case, we wouldn't need most of the rest of this book. They said, Moses has gone up on the mountain too long, and he's probably dead, so let's build an idol to worship. Moses, you let us out here, and we have no food. Moses, we are thirsty, and there's no water. They even tell him in chapter 17, the second half of verse 3, why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children, our livestock with thirst? Now think about this. These people have seen the seven plagues. They've seen the parting of the Red Sea. They have seen the, the stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written and given to them by God. He provided manna. He provided water, the pillar of fire. And yet, after all of this, they are telling Moses, it would have been better for them to have stayed back in Egypt as slaves under bondage than to be where they were at that present moment. And we would like to think we would be different. And we shake our heads at them. But under those circumstances, would we? Here, we're struggling after three or four months of the coronavirus. Yet through it all, God made provision for them every step of the way. This brings us to our text this morning, as the people are still out wandering the wilderness. And I'm starting in chapter 17, verse 8, and I'm reading from the NIV version. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Pick out some men to go and fight the Amalekites tomorrow, and I will stand on top of the hill holding the stick uh, that God told me to carry. Joshua did as Moses commanded him and went out to fight the Amalekites, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, as long as Moses held up his arms, the Israelites won. But when he put them down, the Amalekites started winning. When Moses' arms grew tired, let's stop there a second. Remember, Moses and Aaron were in their 80s when they first went to see Pharaoh. So when Moses' arms grew tired, 
Aaron and Hur brought a stone for him to sit on while they stood beside him, one on one side, one on the other, and held up his arms, holding them steady until the sun went down. And in this way, Joshua totally defeated the Amalekites. You see, Moses knew what he had to do to God's chosen people would win the day. Every fiber of his being was to give all that he could in obedience to God. But while his heart and mind were steadfast, his strength was waning. He needed someone to come by his side to help him. And there was Aaron, who had been with him every step of this journey, who, along with the assistance of her, helped Moses carry on the will and work of God. And with their help, that is just what Moses was able to to do. Earlier this year, I was called upon to do something that is like that, to be like an Aaron. In February, Barry Burns, our district superintendent, approached me, an untrained, uncertified layperson with a pressing need. There was a two-point charge in our district. It was being led by a pastor who had been diagnosed with a brain tumor the previous fall. He had undergone brain surgery and was receiving treatments, yet he continued to serve those churches and conduct two worship services every Sunday morning. With every fiber of his being, it was his desire to do all that he could to further God's kingdom in that area. That pastor, however, was and continues to be in the fight of his life. And though his mind and heart are still willing and determined to serve the cause of Christ in that community, the strength of his body was waning and he was struggling to continue to hold up that rod of God. I was asked if I would be willing to come alongside of that pastor to ease his workload as he continued his battle with that dreaded disease. The plan was to have me take over one of the two services every week, one week at one church, the next at the other. In that way, the pastor could continue to serve his flock without further compromising his health and strength. I was asked to help, to be an errand to that pastor, and I had a decision to make. Am I going to say yes to God and come alongside of a brother in Christ who needs help? Now, we all have to be aware that the closer we get to God and the more often that we say yes to him, the bigger the target we place on ourselves. Satan is not at all pleased by any decision of ours that leads us closer to God and will try every way that he can to dissuade us from taking that path. I told you on my first Sunday that I was with you that I have no vision in my right eye because it is pertinent to what was going on at this time, now seems to be the appropriate time to fill you in on what exactly happened. On Monday morning, February 3rd of this year, I woke up and was sitting down to breakfast, and I realized I couldn't see anything out of my right eye. There was no warning, no trauma, no pain, no illness. I just woke up, and I thought, hmm, I probably should get that checked out. That afternoon, I was seeing my eye doctor who immediately referred me to a retina specialist the next morning, who in turn immediately referred me to the Cleveland Clinic Cole Eye Institute. First thing Thursday morning, I was seeing one of the nation's foremost retina specialists. He immediately suspected an internal virus as the cause of the problem, conducted a battery of tests, and put me on a strong oral antiviral medication and scheduled me for a follow-up in a few days. You see, it was the Wednesday between my second and third visit to Cleveland that I had my meeting with Barry, and he asked me to help out that pastor. I asked him if I could have until Friday to give him an answer as I explained to him what was going on and that I had another appointment the next day, and he readily agreed. When I went up the next day, by mid-afternoon, I was being emergency admitted to the Cleveland Clinic Hospital as the medication I was on was doing a number on my kidneys, was not arresting the virus, 
which was threatening to spread to my other eye, possibly my brain and spinal column. Thankfully, the MRI revealed that it had not done so yet, but I was put on an IV medication and a saline drip that ended up, and ended up being there for four days. So on Friday, the day after my admission, the day I told Barry I'd give him an answer, I was on the phone to the superintendent and indicated that while I intended to say yes and that I should be out in time for that last Sunday in February, which was planned to be the first Sunday of this rotation, I wasn't sure how comforting it would be to the new pastor to know that his relief pitcher was calling from a hospital bed at the Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> I was put on an antiviral IV therapy three times a day and was sent home. I did, in fact, handle that first Sunday as scheduled, and all seemed on track. And the next day, I was up for another follow-up visit in Cleveland and was emergency admitted again. The medication I was on was not working, as there were signs the virus was, in fact, spreading to the good eye, and they had to try a different medication. And I remained there this time for five days, feeling fine, feeling frustrated, but understanding what they were trying to do for me to keep me from going completely blind. I was out in time and was able to conduct the service that next week as well. The irony of it all was that that pastor was the one who had cancer, was undergoing chemotherapy, felt rotten a lot of the times, was weak, yet I was the one who spent the entire week from the day after that first Sunday till the day of the uh, second in the hospital feeling perfectly fine. I had said yes, however, to God, to the superintendent, and to a brother in need despite the challenge the devil tried to throw in my way and continued to assist him until just before coming here. They finally got my medications regulated and the virus is in remission. They saved the sight in my left eye and although the damage had already been done in my right, I'll be on oral antiviral medication the rest of my life to keep it from coming back. But I stand here today the recipient of a huge number of prayers on my behalf. And the recipient of God's grace and mercy in saving enough of my sight to allow me to serve him and you in this place today. Now, I'm not talking about this day to say that I am somehow special for answering the call of God to serve or that I should be praised in any way for what I did during those months of being an errand to that pastor. Rather, I firmly believe that each one of us as Christians is called to respond to God's call for us to come alongside of others in this broken and hurting world, to be his ambassador, to show others that they are not alone, that God loves them and that there's a place for them in his kingdom, regardless of who they are or what they have done. The challenge, the challenge for each one of us this morning is to look around us. Think of the people who we come in contact with each day. They may be struggling physically, emotionally, financially, Spiritually, they may be grieving a loss, experiencing loneliness and isolation, feeling overwhelmed by the challenges that this life has thrown at them. They may be sitting just down from you in the pew in this sanctuary this morning. How can each one of us be the hands and feet of Christ to these people? How can we be an errand to them, to come alongside of them, to help them carry on? Now, I'm not talking about preaching to people and telling them what we think they should do. People don't care one bit about what we have to say until they first see that we care. Let me repeat that. People won't care one bit about what we have to say until they first see that we care. 
Look, folks, we know that there is pain all around us. People turn to alcohol, drugs, sex, food, gambling, all kinds of other addictions in an effort just to make the hurting stop. Maybe one of you here this morning in this sanctuary is struggling with one of these things. What if all it took from us was a phone call, a visit, a listening ear, a text, a letter, an errand or other act of kindness, a refusal to turn our backs and give up on them? What if these people, instead of the path they had been on, were now able to experience the glory of heaven for all eternity, partially because we were willing to take the time and cared enough to say yes to the urgings of the Holy Spirit. Would it be worth the time and effort on our parts to see that happen? A few months ago, I heard a young man in his late 20s give his testimony. He told about how he had rejected the church early in his life. He got hooked up with the wrong crowd. He got into alcohol, drugs, sex, even homosexuality for a while, atheism, hung around with some friends who were Satanists. In short, his life was a mess and certainly not a life we would want to see anyone fall into. But he had a grandmother who loved him dearly, who prayed for him daily and told him so. It was her wish and desire that he would agree to go on an Emmaus walk. The Walk to Emmaus is a ministry of the Upper Room that sponsors spiritual retreats around the country called Emmaus Walks. The purpose is to allow the participants called pilgrims to spend time in the presence of God, a time of reflection and spiritual renewal, and to come in contact with the living Christ and experience his love for them in a very special way. Anyway, this young man's grandmother passed away, but he loved her so much and knew it was her wish that he would go, so he signed up. When he first got there, he hated every bit of it. He didn't really want to be there. He resented the others who were there and did not have any desire to participate. He just wanted to get through the weekend, fulfill his grandmother's wish, check off that on the list, that box on the list, and get back to his life. But as the weekend went on, however, the Holy Spirit started working on him hard. His eyes were opening to the disaster he had been making of his life, and he learned that Christ loved him, died for him, forgave him, and wanted a relationship with him. Before the weekend was over, this young man opened his heart to the Lord and gave his life to Christ. Those few days transformed his life, and he walked away from his old life and was given a new one. It was not only his future here on earth that was transformed, but his eternity was transformed. And now he has even served on a team for one of those weekends, helping to transform the lives and eternities of others. And all because of one grandmother who refused to give up on this prodigal child and continued to love him. and prayed for him unceasingly. And she must be looking down from heaven with enormous joy for the miracle that God has worked in this young man's life. You see, in God's eyes, no one is ever too old to make a difference for his kingdom. Maybe the way we do it is different than maybe we would have a few years back, but we all have a role to play and we're not done yet. 
The question for all of us is do we care enough to move from thoughts to actions? My prayer this morning is that in the next week and beyond, we are each open to seeing who God would have us come alongside of and be errands to. After all, isn't that what siblings, brothers and sisters, are supposed to do for each other? Let us pray. Father God, we know that you have work for us all to do. Help us to be open to your leading. Help us to be errands to those you created and are in need. And help us to show them what the love of Christ really looks like. Amen and amen. Our closing hymn uh, this morning is, I am thine, O Lord. First and fourth verses of on page 419. And it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious pleading side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. The rod of God. <laughs> Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>